Sketch twelve of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stage directions and golfer read by Joseph Tabler. The first lesson scene country club grounds they stroll toward the first tea she speaks well of course i've got to learn for two years i've held the championship for the only frivolous female under fifty who cannot play golf and i'm getting tired of it you're under such a disadvantage if you don't speak the language you know why i've been to dinners when the conversation might just as well have been in ancient patagonian as far as i was concerned well there are several reasons in the first place everybody went wild on the subject and the easiest and most original attitude was ignorance and i'm ignorant enough i've never even followed around a course oh that's where we get the caddy isn't it you see i do know that the caddy is a boy and not one of the sticks Oh, oh, clubs, I mean. Why do you have to have such a lot of sticks? Uh, clubs, I mean. Oh, different ones for different plays. Hmm, now they look just alike to me, except some are fatter than the others. This is the starting place, isn't it? Where the crowd is. <laughs> Teen ground, you call it? There's a man going to, what do you call it? Tea. Let's go closer so I can see him do it what's the little hump of dirt for oh i see i shouldn't think you'd need that it looks easy enough follows man's motions carefully her eye following the ball into the distance Ooh, he's pretty good isn't he Ooh, is he a dub why i thought he was good now here goes a girl let's see her tea away what did i say oh i'm in tea off isn't she a crank about her little old hump of dirt? Well, that wasn't much of a shot, was it? What are all these people standing around for? Dear me, I hate to begin before them. I'm sure I can do as well as that girl, though, who just teed out. Takes club and tries to place her hands on handle according to his directions. I see, right hand like this. Mm hmm free swing isn't that free enough oh yes feet on the ground <laughs> and only swing from the waist i see oh i can do it all right fix the little ant hill for me now i'm going to keep my eye on the ball my feet on the ground swing from the waist up follow around and and incidentally hit the ball she swings and smiles proudly her eye searching the distant horizon for the twirling white ball where did it go where a look of dismay obliterates the smile and her eyes search the ground at her feet absurd why i never touched it did i well did you ever try it again how many trials do i get well i know but i thought i did measure the distance this time i'll surprise you now look out ask that woman to stand back she bothers me she swings vigorously oh goodness me what a hole ha <laughs> ha not so deep as a well nor so wide as a church door but twill serve it's hot isn't it now this time i'm surely off one two three go swings again ah oh, how far was that caddy twenty feet well that's pretty good isn't it now we just walk along hitting toward that flag it'll take me a week to get to that first one now little boy you give me the biggest club in the bag how could i be expected to hit anything with this little shiny stick i don't care whether it's the right one or not i want the big one now here goes she swings that must be fully two feet well i hit it and that's something don't you want to go on and wait for me at the flag i hate to spoil your game well come on then if you're quite sure i won't spoil your game suppose you give my ball one good crack this time to show me how it's done oh beautiful it must have gone a mile how splendid and strong you are 
Do you know, I like it all but the little ball. If you didn't have to worry about the pesky ball all the time, I think it would be a fine game. Looks around. Everybody is getting ahead of us, just on my account. Now aren't you sorry you aren't playing with some other girl? Well, if you're satisfied. Oh, here's your ball. Watches him drive. I wish I could do that. How long would it take you to teach me to play like that? All your life? Well, you must think I'm a stupid, or else you're a very poor teacher. I see. You think a good teacher ought to be able to keep a pupil forever. No, it wouldn't work with me. I've always gotten tired of teachers. Like playthings. In a month. I didn't say my teachers were playthings. You aren't listening to me. You're looking for that ball and neglecting my conversation in a shameful manner. Dear, oh dear, I have to hit it again? Swings her club. You're right. It would take me a lifetime. I never saw such feeble efforts. My, it's hot. I never felt the heat worse. Now what do you do about the river? Pick up your ball and carry it over the bridge? Drive it over? You don't say so. Oh, I see what you mean. Now you needn't laugh. How should I know you meant knock it over when you said drive? No, I didn't think you meant on horseback. See that boat down there, moored to the tree? Hmm, doesn't it look inviting? How many more holes are there? Sixteen. Oh, gracious. Where? In the boat? What would I give if you paddled me to Summerdale for lunch? I'd give anything I own in the world. Pon honor, I would. What can we do with the sticks? Oh, yes, I'd forgotten the caddy, and evidently he's forgotten us. He's actually lying down over there in the shade. Steady her now till I get in. Gets into boat. Oh, this is heaven. It's awfully good of you, Victor, to be golf pastor and master. But you don't know with what joy and rapture I'm saying. Here endeth the first lesson. End of Sketch 12《Sketch 13 of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Devora Allen. A Summer Idol. Scene. Drawing Room. Discovered. Tommy and a Caller. Tommy. We've been at a now hotel. Um, uh hmm. We was there all the whole summertime. Yes, and Mama and Papa was there too, and Lizzie, she's the nurse, but she didn't count much because she was always talking to a waiter there. You bet I did have a good time. They was lots of children there. Oh, just wagon loads. Some was awful bad ones like Lester Jones and Jimmy Banks and Bud and Charlie and, and lots more bad ones. And gee, we had fun. Us children had to eat in the children's dining room. Just us and the nurses, you know. And we used to throw things peaches and crackers and things and once lester jones throwed a spoonful of soft-boiled egg right at his nurse you ought to seen her face gee and once the manager came in and told us that if we didn't behave we'd have to go home and bud all and he had his squirt gun and he made it go off at the manager and it all went down his collar in the behind of his neck oh my he was mad he tried to find out who did it but he couldn't so he just told our parents on us and they give it to us awful Yes, we used to play on the beach, mornings. We went in swimming and yanked the ladies' feet from under em. Gee, you oughta heard em yell. Once, I was just yanking Miss Molly's feet out. She was a lady there. And old smarty Archie came, he was her beau, and he just grabbed me and dunked me under and drowned me, pretty near. But I just guess we got even with him. I told the fellas about it, and at night on the porch, oh, it was a great big porch, you know, and music and things, and nights, us kids used to run round and catch him spoonin'. And we heard Smarty Archie asking Miss Molly to go horseback in next morning, so us kids fixed it up, and we got up early and put sand burrs under Smarty Archie's horse's tail. We stuck em on so you couldn't tell they was there, but the horse, he could. Gee, you oughta seen that horse go. Every time he switched his tail, he went faster, and Smarty Archie got throwed and skinned up, and us kids was good and glad, cause it served him right for dunkin' a kid bout half his size. 
Sometimes when it was rainy, we stayed in and played circus and things. But that wasn't as much fun, cause the girls was always sticking in. Once when Bud all and sister just would come and we didn't want her, I got that squeezy thing out of my mother's room. My mother cleans her teeth with it. You squeeze it, you know, and a pink snake comes out. Well, we told Jessie all in it was candy, and we'd give it to her if she'd go away, and she ate the whole thing, and she, she was sick, and had a doctor and everything, and then she went and told on us just like an old girl, and we caught it, I tell you. Sometimes we played in the hall. Children mustn't, you know, but we used to when our parents was out, and way down at the end they's a hose, you know, like in the garden, and once Bud Allen took it down when we was being a fire engine, and you ought to seen the water shooting out, and we couldn't stop it. So we just ran out and was playing on the beach when they asked us if we did it. Gee, you ought to seen that hall. It was a regular river. But, oh, the mostest fun was Harry. He was the bellboy. And you have a clock in your room, and you turn the hands round to what you want, and it rings downstairs and Harry brings it. And we kids would ring for ice water in my room and then run upstairs to Bud's room. So when Harry came, there wasn't nobody there. Gee, it used to make him swear. We used to hide back of the stairs and hear him. But what? All right, I'm coming. That's Lizzie. I wish we had a waiter for her here. She bothers me lots. Well, goodbye. There's lots more I could tell you about that hotel, but I gotta go. It's an awful nice place. You ought to go there. Yes, Lizzie, I'm a coming. Exit. End of sketch 13. Sketch 14 of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. The LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage directions read by Eva Davis. Butler, read by Thomas Peter. Maid, read by Linda Olson Fytock. Los Angeles. Sketch 14. Below Stairs. Scene. Servants' Hall. Enter the butler, who drops into a chair with a deep sigh. Enter the maid, who also drops down, sighing. Butler. <sighs> oh, yeah. Maid. Ah. <sighs> oh, well, I hope so. The carriage door slammed before I came down. Fans languidly with a paper. What a day! It's begun rang this morning, and it's been getting worse steady all day. First she came into my pantry, and says to my face, to my face, mind you, that the silver had not been claimed for a week. I says, Madam, it was claimed five days ago today. Well, she says, it's black. And you haven't had a dinner party nor a lunch for two days, and not a thing on earth to do but clean the silver. Then I spoke right up. If there was men enough in the stable, I says, so the under butler wouldn't have to ride on the box with you, I says. The silver would be claimed twice a week, but I says, would have to economize on the under butler. I do the best I can, mum, I says. Sure you do. We all do. If she'd economize a little on her clothes, we could have another under butler, and it would be more comfortable for all of us. Just hand me a sip of that sherry maggot to quite me nerves. <sighs> Zinna dinner. I was most frantic. She was a bundle of nerves, and he was a bundle of grunts. Oh, I was so flustered I gave him the wrong cigar, and I gave her scotch for Roy. And all those zuzus at the party rubbered their heads off. Oh, I saw that old Mrs. Smith Smythe grinning, and I wanted to spill champagne down her back. Well, you ain't the only mourner on the binge. She hasn't been to bed before three o'clock for three days, and she's cross as two sticks. It's Maggie here and Maggie there, and not those shoes, Maggie, and. I tore you to have that uppity cloak cleaned. By God, I thought I'd shake her. You told me about that cloak this morning, I says. Did you expect me to have it cleaned and home by tonight, I says? She gave me a look, but she's too smart to make me real mad. Look at the way we work, from nine in the morning to late at night. 
and them not out more than three days awake to lunch, and four nights awake to dinner. And what do you get for your service? A paltry hundred a month in your livery, and no thanks. Ah, oh, it's a hard life, Maggie, and that's no joke. Well, look at me. What with her breakfast to be took up at nine, and her lunch clothes laid out, and her afternoon clothes climbed, and her dinner clothes pressed, I've never a minute to myself. Now, you get a rest when they're off to dinner, but not me. Grins. Go on. You were sleeping two hours yesterday. Well, goodness knows I needed it. Don't she get in at all hours, and don't I have to wait up? Well, what's doing tonight? Oh, I have a few friends coming to like supper in the servants' hall. Am I in it? Sure you are, Maggie. You're a fine girl, McCree. Do you think I'd love you out? Who's coming? Kevard laid for tin. Silver and plate? Sure. Wine? Sure. Dancing afterwards? Same, same. Me and you to lead the cotillion. Cotillion? You don't say. I do. You know they are in the habit of pitching their cotillion favours into the wastebasket the morning after. And I am in the habit of collecting them out. Oh, say. Oh, I've got a grand lot of stuff. Not for ten figures. Oh, say. Ain't we come il vote? She rises and sweeps by him, saying, Ring the bell, please, Martin, for me maid. I must dress for Mr. Martin Matthew Moriarty's ball. Order me carriage at living. Ah, here you are, Maggie. Lay out me green satin and me yellow coat. <laughs> I'll be with you in the twinkling of an eye, Moriarty. She runs out, looks after her. Maggie, you're a fine girl. He rises and stretches. Oh, I don't know. I may marry that girl. She most suits me. Well, we'll see. Exit. End of sketch 14. Sketch 15 of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage directions and role of Mrs. Wiggin, read by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. On Woman's Rights. Scene. Schoolhouse at Bird Center. Discovered. Woman's Club in session. Mrs. Wiggin takes the floor begins in hasty and deprecatory manner i ain't a going to try to explain to you what's that miss parsons address the chair <laughs> what you talking about i ain't addressing no chair she pauses while the parliamentary rule is explained to her dawning intelligence seen on her face Oh, I see. It's parliamentary, is it? Well, I'm glad you told me. Is it a he chair or a she chair, Miss Parsons? Call me to order. Who's it calling me to order? You tend to your own order, Malvini Springer, and you'll have your hands full. I don't notice so much order in your housekeeping to chairman what's that oh i see well now why didn't you explain that to me at first malvini excuse me you see i ain't been to no club meeting before the first one you had i was having trouble with my hired help y'all know jemima hawkins well She's been with me going on ten years, just like one of the family, and she had to go home to her folks. She's got a lot of folks Jemima has. 
her father and mother and nine brothers and sisters and they all got some disease or other why once i was up there to see miss hawkins and she lined them kids up and counted them out number one heart disease number two rickets number three lunger et cetera, down through the list i reckon they got all the diseases in the catechism and so jemima had to go home of course and so i couldn't come to the club meeting and next meeting you had the twins was croupy and what oh yes well excuse me i'll get down to business now my papers on women's rights and i was a-going to have it all rid out and tied up with a blue ribbon and all but it took so long i give that up and so i ain't really going to read no paper at all but will speak just from the tablets of memory i don't know just what women's rights is but i don't suppose that makes any difference in a speech and there's one thing i'm dead sure i do know and that is what women's rights ought to be a woman ought to have rights she's a weak creature alongside a fellow man and she ought to be allowed her rights woman ain't never had a fair show she was handiclapped from the first being made out of a rib the way she was and so much ought not to be expected of woman as otherwise man has always been the stronger animal but woman ain't without her weepings namely and to wit nails feet and tongue specially tongue and with these few she rose to her present pinnacle of glory women from the first has been the leader eve led adam and we've been leading men ever since so of course some rights has been growing along with us there's several i think of namely and to wit one the right to change her mind two the right to say the last word three the right to ask her man what time he got in four the right to mean yes when she says no and others etc to take these one by one and singularly we see number one the right to change her mind of course all humans change the mind but especially women but how are you ever going to learn anything if you don't change the mind i used to think that a husband was a great convenience for i got one now how was i to learn myself that a husband's worse than twins unless i change my mind that's what i ask you folks and you're all women and have the same experience so i needn't say no further on that head number two the right to get the last word now i hold that somebody has got to get the last word so it may as well be woman and usually is but woman gets little enough here below and she may as well get what she can number three the right to ask a man what time he got in well it ain't a-goin to do her no good to ask about it for there ain't a man on earth that'll tell the truth but it's a satisfaction for her to know what a good liar she's got now just to show what a mean-spirited man'll descend to i knowed a man that said twelve o'clock to the usual question and just then the cuckoo clock hollered three and he up and cuckooed ten times but lo he found out thirteen was a unlucky number so you see woman has a right to all the rights she has got now there is some females as is a pining for the right to vote in politics along with the men 
and we all know one sister who leaves her children to the care of themselves while she's a trotting around trying to get other women to vote she's got the worst kids in the country and ought to be home managing them i went to town once to hear what she had to say and left the twins with their dad and while i was gone one of em fell in the well and was most drowned and the other fed whitewash to the calf so i made up my mind i'd had enough of the voting business now i know i don't want no man monkeying around my kitchen and i reckon men feels the same politics is men's work men has run politics for a good many years and i reckon they're welcome to keep on doing it i don't want the job what would we do with a woman president for instance i bet she never could get a cabinet together and it would be worse than a sewing bee if she did so women had better stay to harm the rights you want is these namely and to wit to manage your home your children and your husband to suit yourself and i got my opinion of any female as can't do that in closing i would say that rights is rights and women is women and they ought to have em exit end of sketch fifteen Sketch number 16 of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage Directions and Rolls of Melindy and Mr. Abraham Ebenezer White. Read by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. A Highly Colored Sketch. Scene Melindy Johnson's Kitchen. Discovered Melindy Singing. Enter Mr. Abraham Ebenezer White. Good evening, Miss Melinda Johnson. Oh, it's you, is it? No, it ain't me. It's some other nigger. Is y'all at home this evening? I don't know if I is or not. I might be, and again, I mightn't. What you want anyway, Mr. Abraham White? Want? I don't want nothing. I come to make a call on you. Am you'll never see a gentleman making a call before? Sure I is. But all the gentlemen what call on me is in the habit of sending up their card. Well, hold on. I gonna send up my card if y'all give me time. Why's your butler? I ain't seen no hands stretch out for to take my card. Grins and bridles. <laughs> well, here's the hand. Now let's see the card. Who you say want to see this evening? Miss Melindy Johnson is the lady's name. Well, I don't know if she'll see you or not. She ain't so stuck on you. Say, how long you gonna stay here, Mr. White? Till I get kicked out. Well, you might as well sit down then. So I might. Jess is cheap. Starts to sit, then sees the lack of chairs. Say, look at ya. I don't want to sit on the only chair. You sit down. No, I don't want to sit down. I'd rather stand up. Oh, go on. Sit down. No, sir. I couldn't think of depriving you of your seat. No depravity at all, miss. No depravity at all. She sits down. How's your folks? My folks is all right. How's your folks? My folks is all right. Exceptin George Washington and Grover Cleveland and Abraham Lincoln. They's all got something the matter with them, but the rest of us is able to take a pork chop now and then. That surely is good news, Mr. White. I was glad to hear that. 
say look a here didn't i see you flaxin around with that barber shop coon last night mr rastus harris if that's the gentleman y'all's alludin at done took me to a minstrel show i ain't got no use for that coon he ain't got no use for you neither i think he's the swellest most galubrious coon i ever set my eyes on ma he does blow the money he done hold on to a quarter like it was a ticket on the kingdom come yes well it's easy enough to blow your money when you make it shootin craps but when you work for all the money you gets you don't go out and blow it all one night on no flirtatious nigger woman what don't know you're on the street the next time she meets you look a here mr white who you alludin at i ain't alludin at nobody well that's a good thing i don't know as you got any place criticizing anybody any man that's sittin up to yell or trash like that anastasia brown ain't got no place criticizing nobody who's sitting up to anastasia brown why y'all is ain't i see you dancing with her at the jolly club's ball well i only danced with her once well that was once more than anybody else did ma i thought i would die a laughing the way she was a sitting around the wall i reckon she's going to find out her aristocratical ways won't go down in our set lord i felt sorry for the girl yes you did i heard how you took her home and how you kissed her kissed her kissed that anastasia brown why I'd just as soon kiss old pete thompson's mule as that trash who told you i kissed her well that's all right who told me you kissed her i don't see how you expect to keep company with high-toned ladies oh you ain't so much flaxin around with that barber shop coon anastasia brown ain't the only scarecrow in the cornfield now look a here merlindy johnson i's put up with all the foolin i's gwine to y'all's got to take your choice yours mine or yours hisn now is you or ain't you i don't know if i is or not is you going to give up that barber shop coon ma he has got the fun manner is his you gwine quit foolin with that crab shooter ma he does throw the money you gwine leave off foolin with that second hand fashion plate maybe he don't wear the fine clothes well go on and take em then and you're welcome to him about all the snub-nosed bow-legged cigar stall indians i ever see he the worst he simply nauseates me that's what he does i wouldn't take him to a dog fight but if he's the pineapple of your eye why go on and marry him you got my sympathy starts to go out well what you rushing around here for like a chicken with his head cut off i ain't gwine to stay while well, i ain't wanted who said you wasn't wanted why you did if you're gwine marry that coon i can't afford to associate with you i can't risk my reputation who said i was going to marry him you said so yourself that's who oh i never did say so i ain't got no more intention of marrying with him than i has of marrying you well look a year merlindy johnson if yo am a going to marry him yo is a going to marry me is that so who said so i said so that's who said so well i like your nerve calls you do ladies always likes a nervous man puts arm about her say melindy does your love your honey oh so so i ain't so crazy about you 
can't think of nothing else but you, you, you. I die for you. I sigh for you. Nights when I sleep and I wake to find us weeping all for you. Lulu, Lou, I was dreaming all the time about you. Lulu. Accent. End of sketch number 16. Sketch number 17 of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage directions and role of Mammy, read by Linda Olson Vitak, Los Angeles. A Dark Brown Diplomat Scene, Mammy's Kitchen Discovered, Mammy singing at her ironing board Miss Winston, y'all calling me? I's here in the kitchen, ma'am. Y'all looking kind of tired like this morning. I hope you am feeling badly. Ma'am, mad with me? Why, well, for God, Miss Winston, what I done? Things are missing from y'all kitchen? Why, that mighty strange. I been here in the kitchen all the time, and I ain't missed nothing. Does I take things home with me? Why, yes, sometimes. We all does. Night for last. Let me see. Yes, I reckon I did take a few things that night. That was the night I took some things to old Miss Johnson. She's so poly. I ain't take nothing much, though. Just a carcass of an old chicken. I know you ain't going to have no use for. Most a whole chicken? No, ma'am. Your man's stuckin' about that, Miss Winston. Want nothing but old ham full of bones that I took. Why, Miss Johnson only got four children, and there wasn't but one helping around, so you see yourself ain't nothing but a carcass. What else I took? I, I don't just remember. Sugar? Yes, ma'am, I reckon there was a little sugar. And sweet potatoes? Yes, ma'am, just a few naughty ones. I know you ain't going to have no use for. Butter? Yes, ma'am. Might of butter. Can't have sweet potatoes without butter, you know, Miss Winston. Cake? No, ma'am. There wasn't no cake. I reckon that's about all day was in that basket. Does I know what, ma'am? That stealing? For God, Miss Winston, that ain't stealing. What is stealing? Why, I reckon when you bust into houses of peoples you don't know that you ain't got no acquaintance with, that's stealing. Why ain't I ask you for the things? Well, Miss Winston, I know when you hear how poorly old Miss Smith is, I know you're going to give them to me, so what's the use of asking you? Did I say Miss Smith? Where well, I met Miss Johnson. It was Miss Johnson I took him to. She's the one that's poorly. Eat myself? Miss Winston, I give you my word of honor. I ain't had a smell of them things myself. Yes, ma'am. I hear you. Yes, ma'am. I gwine promise never to do that no more. I want to ask you for everything I take. Yes, ma'am. I know the cream go awful fast, like, but it's that cat you got. That's the most expensingest cat I ever done know nothing about. She gets on the breakfast table for y'all gets down in the morning and gets her hate in the cream pitcher. I cotched her at it lots of times. Whip her? Lord, Miss Winston, I do whip her. 
why other day i fired a flat iron at her head but it don't do no good can't get cream out of the bottle that cat can why miss winston you don't know that cat why i seen her get on to the shelf and stick her claws in the pasteboard top of the bottle and yank it off and then stick her other paw in and lick up the cream that's the truth i'm telling you the cake no ma'am the cat don't eat the cake it's the mices i never did see a house so full of mices some mornings i come down to get the breakfast and i find they ate up half a cake overnight that cat well she won't touch mices she got to have cream she has ma'am mr winston says my cooking don't make up for my extravagance well i don't know what he means ain't no one ever found no fault before with my cooking never that i heard tell of why judge harlow where i was for i came here he said i was the most originalist cook he ever done heard tell of he said my cookin beat all dat what he said he said he didn't think it was right for him to deprive humanity of my cookin and he paid me extra for to go and cook for somebody else he said when you got a good thing twas your duty to push it along that's what he said there ain't never anybody found no fault with my cooking before well i reckon i ain't seem to suit y'all so i better be moving along i's awful sorry to go i is you've been mighty kind to me yo and mr winston i don't reckon i's ever gwine to find no chillin i like as well as y'all chillin lots of folks won't have chillin playin round their kitchen but i likes it there's powerful lot of company in chillins calls what that no now miss alice honey you can't make patty cakes now i was busy talking to your ma what you give me a kiss if i let you well you come run along here and give me the kiss and we'll see about them cakes watches child in and bends to kiss her then shoes her out mighty smart child miss alice is i's mighty fond of her and she love old mammy too well miss winston when you want me to go don't want me to go but if you don't like my cooking and my extravagance i allow you ain't want me to stay i's willing to go i'd rather go than for you to have any hard thoughts about me i's a poor old woman miss winston but i got a honest heart you say you ain't sending me off you just a scolding me well bless the lord honey you did give me a scare i thought you were gwine to turn me out this time show miss winston i give you my solemn word i gwine reform i gwine be so saving you won't know me now what you want for dinner tonight oh yes for i forget it could you let me off on sunday for the day i want to go to a funeral old miss johnson's yes um, same lady well she ain't dead yet you see it's like this she's mighty poorly and likely to go any minute and she said that the corpse ain't got no show at all of the funeral so she gwine have hers fall she goes it's gwine to be sunday all the colored folks in town is gwine yes i'd like to go all day it's going to be mighty long funeral yes thank you miss winston i hope you can arrange it for me i certainly would predate it listens what's that 
Dat's them chillin on my clean back steps. I gwine snuck out there and catch em at it. Tiptoes to door, then breaks out. Yo, chillin, what y'all doin' here? Am I told you not to play on my clean steps? You want me to break your necks? Exit. End of sketch number 17. Sketch 18 of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage directions read by Thomas Peter. Mrs. Payson de Slyster, read by Linda Olson Fytak. Elmira Beecham, read by Linda Olson Fytak. Stuttering Young Woman, read by Emma Charlotte. Dressy Young Woman, read by Emma Charlotte. Pearl, the Child Wonder, read by T. J. Burns. Sketch eighteen, at Madame Newbery's. Scene, Madame Newbery's fashionable finishing school. Discovered, Jane Mortimer, secretary to Madame Newbery, sitting at the office desk and interviewing candidates. Enter, with immense empressement, Mrs. Payson de Slyster and her daughter Eleonora. Mrs. Payson de Slyster, in a large and mellifluous voice accustomed to command. I wish to see Madame Newberry. Will you send in my card? She is busy, you say? Well, I am Mrs. Payson de Slyster. No doubt she will see me. She makes it a rule to see no one during teaching hours. Dear me, how tiresome. I suppose I could come again, but it would inconvenience me greatly. Hesitates. Well, I suppose I could transact my business with you, if necessary, but I would prefer to deal with Madame Newberry direct. I wish to make some inquiries about the school, preparatory to placing my daughter, Eleonora, in Madame Newberry's charge. How large is the school? Indeed, that's unfortunate. I should have preferred it smaller. Are there really nice girls in the school? Ah, Eleonora has associated with none but the best of course, and I should not wish her to form any ties with ordinary persons. I do not wish her to study much. She is not strong. Oh, yes. What do you teach? She takes catalogue from secretary and reads aloud. Voice culture, music, dancing, fencing, pronunciation, deportment, Reading, French, German, and elocution. Languidly. Mm hmm, these do very well. With more interest. Will she learn to enter a drawing room? Good. And to converse on topics of a interest. Conversation classes, you say? Literature, art, science, politics. Is that the sort of thing they discuss? I didn't mean that sort of topics of interest. I meant the sort of talk that one needs at a dinner. I do not wish her to learn to discuss politics. It's no topic for a lady. Besides, I wouldn't have Eleonora become a strong-minded woman for anything in the world. I have always formed her opinions for her, and I have been very careful what she learns. The main difficulty with Eleonora is her shyness. I can't imagine where she gets it, not from my family, nor her father's either, I'm sure. It's a great trial to me, a great affliction. I've brought her to Madame Newberry to have this overcome. I feel convinced that it can be trained out of her. 
of course in society to-day a shy woman doesn't get anywhere none of eleonora's friends are shy i am sure and she has always been sent to the most expensive schools i really don't see where she gets it well i hope you can do something with her now about the hours of course i do not wish her to study outside of school hours she always gets so interested in her work that she is absolutely good for nothing else of course i do not wish her school to interfere with other things i have always thought too much study unhealthy for a young girl well then she can begin on monday at nine dear me that seems very early is it really necessary that she should be here at nine well it seems a barbarous hour to me her name oh yes eleonora payson de slyster thirty-two astor court age nineteen suppose you just put down on that card special attention to shyness so madame newberry will not forget i will send you a check to-day what is the uh, uh, oh is that all why i paid five hundred more at her last school are you sure that really nice girls are in this school well she may try it a week or so i think that is all come along eleonora good morning two enter a gentlemanly-looking young woman with a strong jaw and a long stride she speaks in a tiny thread-like voice which is unspeakably funny in connection with her mannish manners she speaks is madame newberry here well i want to speak to her when will she be at leisure oh you're her secretary are you well you do just as well i'm a lecturer and i wish to develop my voice a little bit i have understood that i could have it done here what sort of lecturer why i'm elmira beecham haven't you ever heard of me i'm one of the best-known lyceum lecturers in the west to-day and before many years have rolled away the whole length and breadth of this land from the grey atlantic to the blue pacific shall ring with the name of beecham no i'm no relation to the liverpool man my desire is to become the greatest reformer of our times all can see that the times are out of joint that society conventions matrimony the family the state and the nation all need revolutionizing all can say that i say but few have the power to undertake such reform this is the task i've set myself i intend to move thousands by my eloquence to arouse them to some realization of the frightful condition of things in general how do i expect to accomplish this ah that is my secret it is the most comprehensive plan evolved by the human brain since the days of napoleon i have had it copyrighted and when the time comes i'll astonish the world with it the only thing i need now is a little more voice and i've come to madame newberry to get it i only have a few weeks to spend in this city before starting on a tour of dakota so i thought i might get my voice improved before i start she could only give me the principles of voice development you say well if i like her i may come back after the dakota trip do you think i could take a lesson this morning i don't want to miss any time it's ten thirty now see that watch the people of osceola gave that to me as a thank offering for showing them in what frightful slavery they live strange that you never heard of me never heard of my lecture reformation of the universe here's some of my clippings see this one from witch's gulch texas miss beecham's lecture 
reformation of the universe is one of the unchallenged literary triumphs of the age you think it wouldn't pay me to study for a few weeks you say she couldn't do anything with my voice in that time why not i've got a very good voice indeed all i want is a little more of it well you needn't hem and haw about it i expect there are other places where i can get a naturally fine voice brushed up a bit where they'll be only too glad to have the name of elmira beecham enrolled upon their roster she makes a dignified but haughty exit three enter sweet-looking girl with retiring manner she blushes and seems to hesitate before speaking i w w want to sp sp speak to m m m madame newbury p p please oh you're the s s <whistles> secretary are you well i w w w <whistles> want to l l learn to con con converse you see i st 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 stutter a li little and i th 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 thought that p p probably she c c could c c <whistles> cure me i've always recited a g g good d d deal and everybody at h h home thinks i could g g go on the st stage if i only did n not st stutter a l l little i can do the b b balcony scene f f from R romeo and Ju juliet by shakespeare the one ab ab about R R romeo R R romeo where for art the th thou R R romeo i played both parts when i gr gr graduated from her, her high sc school and everybody said that it was as g g good as j j julia ma ma marlow i could ca do the two p p parts for y you if you w w want me to of c c course if i st st stuttered very badly i c couldn't th th <whistles> think of going on the st stage but i th thought that m m madame newbury m might cure me in a m month or so oh y yes i have b b been to a sc school of st stuttering i was there a y y <whistles> year but i didn't L -l -l like the m m method there you don't th th think she could cure me if a regular doctor couldn't well i'd rather see m m madame newbury herself if you don't m m mind at t t ten tomorrow w w well i'll be in and d do the b b balcony s <sighs> Scene from R R Romeo and J Juliet by Shakespeare. G -g Good bye. Four. Enter a very dressy young person who switches into a chair. She speaks. This is a school of acting, isn't it? I want to take a few lessons before going on the stage. No, I haven't studied before. That is not much. I don't believe in studying much. It takes all the naturalness out of you. Well, I haven't decided yet just what sort of actress I'll be. I can do tragedy and comedy both. I can do the potion scene from Juliet and the sleepwalking scene from Lady Macbeth. The elocution teacher down home said he never heard anybody do the potion scene any better and i do it and he'd heard most every great actor there is i do a lot of other things do you know a play called a woman's wrongs 
Well, it's the saddest thing you ever heard. It always makes everybody cry. I almost always cry myself when I do it. Oh, it's a grand thing. I'm just crazy about getting on the stage. Of course, my family aren't for it. They think it's awful. But if you're born for it, you might as well go ahead. I think you ought to do what you're cut out to, don't you? Everybody says it's easy to get into a good company if you come out of one of these stage schools. So I thought I'd try this one. How long do you think it would take me to get ready for the stage? Ten years? For goodness sake, do you suppose I'm going to waste ten years getting ready? Why, in ten years I expect to be at the head of my own company. Doesn't take long to be a star now. All you have to do is get in with some pushing manager. I have thought some of grand opera. I can sing a little. I always sang in the choir at home. We gave Esther once, and I played the lead, and everybody was crazy about it. Whenever there's a party at home, they always ask me to sing something from grand opera or the rosary. It goes like this, you know. She sings the rosary, unaccompanied and wandering aimlessly from key to key. I think I'd rather be an actress, though. You have to be so careful when you're a grand opera star. Can't eat much, nor stay up late. You don't think this school is what I want. If it's going to take you ten years to get me ready, I'm sure of it. I just want a few months' work and then a position. I think the school ought to guarantee the position in a good company. You can't do that. Well, then, that settles it. I'm sorry. I suppose I would have been a good advertisement for you. But I have to think of myself, you know. Goodbye. She sails out. 5. Enter a small girl, overdressed, quite unaccompanied, and bearing all the marks of a stage child. She speaks. I'm the little girl the lady came to see you about yesterday. Yes, I'm Pearl. Pearl, the child wonder. They call me on the bills. I'm a vaudeville actress, you know, but I'm out of an engagement now, so somebody told my mother I ought to go to school while we're laying off. I can, because we're flush now. Because I've made good everywhere. I tell you, Pearl the child wonder gets the hand everywhere. I told her I wouldn't come to any reading, writing, arithmetic school, because I hate them. But if I was singing and dancing and all that, I'd just as soon. Oh, I do song and dance and pieces with lightning change. Didn't you ever hear of me? For goodness sake, where have you been living? I've been touring the U.S. for ten years. Oh, yes. They always bill me eight years old. People like you young, you know. But, honest to goodness, I'm twelve. Oh, no, I don't get tired of it. I'm used to it. It's laying off like I am now that makes me tired. That's why I'd just as soon come to your school. What are you going to teach me? I'll do a turn so you can see what I can do. She recites Little Mabel, Little Mabel, with her face against the pain etc., in a sobbing voice, with very accurate gestures. Then she does the inevitable Swiss mountain song with yodel chorus, doing a sort of clog dance. One of my hits is the Floridora Sextet. She sings the sextet, leaping from the place where the man stands to the place where the girl stands. She does it very solemnly. Do you know a piece called The Drunker's Child? The first verse goes like this. A sweet child knelt at her mother's knee to say her evening prayer, when all at once a drunkard's step rang out upon the stair. There's ten verses. It always makes him cry, I tell you. 
then I know a lot more stuff, and dances, of course. All right, go on and tell me what you'll make me do if I stay here. Learn to speak correct? Do you mean grammar? I won't study that. I don't like that. Study real poetry? No, sir. I want funny pieces, or sad ones. I don't want no poetry. Smellin' and deportment? Well, I guess not. I ain't gonna study none of those things. If you won't teach me some new pieces and some new steps, I won't learn nothing. What's the use? I don't need none of those things in my business. I'm making good everywhere now. I guess I don't want none of your finishing school. Well, I'll be off. And break the news to Mother. So long. Little Pearl flounces out. End of sketch 18. Sketch 19 of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage directions read by Thomas Peter. Miss Audrey Gay read by Emma Sharp. Mr. John Marvel read by Chuck Williamson. How it happened. Scene. Beach by moonlight. Discovered. Miss Audrey Gay, a romantic young thing. Mr. John Marvel, not so young, nor romantic. One. She sighs. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? The moon on the water and everything. By Jove, it is lovely. The moon on the water and everything. It almost makes you want to be a poet, doesn't it? Only poets are always so poor. I know a man who writes the sweetest things about love and summer and thinks the newspapers, and says he doesn't make enough to keep him in shoestrings. Isn't that dreadful? Don't you think we ought to do something for our poets, Mr. Marvel? Yes, I do. I think we ought to kill them at birth. Oh, how dreadful! Don't you like poets, Mr. Marvel? I can't say I do. I know too many of them. We've got an oversupply on hand. Let's talk of something interesting. Well, what do you think is interesting? Let's talk about you. Oh, but I'm not. Well, you're so pretty, you don't have to be. Aside. I ought to be kicked for that. By Jove, she thinks it's a compliment. Uh, tell me what sort of thing you like. What sort of things do you think I'd like? Well, you see, I've only known you three days. But that's a long time at a summer resort. So it is. I suppose I ought to know your innermost thoughts by this time. Unfortunately, I've been looking at you instead of thinking about you. What are you most interested in, in the world? Men, you mean? <laughs> so that's what you like best? Embarrassed. Oh, I, I didn't understand. I didn't know you meant. I, well, I said I liked poetry. So you did. What brand do you prefer? Oh, I like Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Don't you? Heaven forbid. And sometimes there's lovely poetry in the smart set in those magazines. Yes? Well, poetry. I've got that down as an absorbing interest. Next. I like novels, too. Janice Meredith and... The Duchess. She nods. How'd you know? How about the drama? Oh, theatre, you mean. I love it. Did you see James K. Hackett in? Alas, no. Theatre is three. Now, let's have something really frivolous. Society? Dancing? 
Oh, yes, I love them. And men? Uh-huh. I'll tell you about your ideal. He's six feet tall, square-shouldered, smooth-faced, is or has been an athlete at Yale or Harvard, dances well, knows the world, none better. A trifle blasé, perhaps, but such a lady-killer. About right, isn't it? Why? How did you know? Who told you? You did. I? Never. I never told a soul except Polly March and Susan Reynolds. Well, no matter. Tell me some more. No. Now you tell me about your ideal. Oh, no, I couldn't. It would be so embarrassing, you know. Why? He, with killing glance. Why? She... She's so near, you know. She'd hear me. Utter surprise. You mean... He nods. I kiss the hand of... My ideal. Suits action to word. Oh, that's a very pretty speech, but I know I, I, I'm not... Don't you think it deserves a reward? He kisses her. Mr. Marvel, what do you mean? Now you've gone and spoiled it all, and I thought you were so nice. I am, really. But you did look so adorable, you know. Well, come on. Where? Home, of course. I can't ever walk on the beach with you again, because you're so silly. He, with faint smile. Out of the mouths of babes. I agree with you entirely, Miss Audrey, and I'll apologize all the way home. I'll go the entire way on my knees, if you like. They walk away briskly. 2. Scene. Hotel porch. Miss Audrey Gay meets her best friend, Polly March. Hello, Polly. How are you this morning? Yes, it's a great day for our sale, isn't it? Oh, yes, I'm going, aren't you? Who? Mr. Marvel? Why, I don't know. I suppose he is. Thought I wouldn't go without him? Why, Polly March, what do you mean? You were where? On the beach, last night. Well, what if you were? Saw us? Excitedly. Polly, you didn't see him. Oh, Polly, you didn't. Who were you with? Not that Hudson man. Oh, dear, he'll tell everybody. I may as well tell you the truth about it. Polly March, come over here and sit down. Now, give me your word of honour. Cross your heart and hope to die if you ever breathe a word I'm going to tell you. Of course, Mamma would be furious if it ever got out. Well, you see, Polly, it was like this. We were walking on the beach and we sat down to rest. Mr. Marvel didn't say anything for a long time, but he sighed and looked at me so sadly. You know how sort of oldish and interesting he looks. And so I asked him why he sighed. He said it was because I reminded him of someone he had loved and lost, and then he told me about her. He was engaged to her, and she had hair and eyes like mine. That's why he likes me. Her name was Evangeline. Isn't that romantic? They used to sit on the beach together. And Polly, he talked so beautifully, and he forgot all about me. He just looked off over the water and whispered, Evangeline. And then he leaned over and kissed me. I never was so surprised in my life. And then all at once he came to, and, my dear, I never saw a man feel so terribly about anything. He couldn't say enough. He had just forgotten all about me and dreamed he was with Evangeline. What could I do? 
he was so pathetic and i felt so sorry for him but of course i scolded him dreadfully you think it was mean of me well i had to i don't know though perhaps you are right after all it wasn't me he kissed it was evangeline there goes the crowd down to the pier we'd better hurry if we're going now remember polly not a word to a living soul they rush off three scene hotel porch marvel meets hudson how are you hudson great day isn't it the penta ought to make good time with this wind what's that did i have a pleasant evening <laughs> why yes fairly what are you driving at saw me what where were you you old blackguard what were you hanging around for why didn't you whistle anybody with you not that march girl good gad she'll spread the good news takes him by the arm and walks him well look here old man it was like this you see miss gay and i had a bet up a bull pup against a kiss and you see i won of course it was all a joke but i was brute enough to make her pay up you know how these things are huh now of course it would be rather nasty for the girl if it got about so i can depend on you to keep it dark can't i much obliged and say shut miss march up can't you i'll appreciate it very much indeed little miss gay is a nice sort of child don't you know not too much brain nor anything of that sort but i wouldn't have her made uncomfortable about the affair you know look they're pulling up the sails on the penta we'd better be off there go the girls now i say m miss gay miss march wait a minute they hurry off four scene hotel porch at night marvel joins miss gay may i speak to you a minute they walk to and fro i suppose you know it's all over the hotel uh, that's what i wanted to speak to you about i don't think speaking will do you any good i can't imagine who told it she hotly well i can tell you it was that hudson man who's such a dear friend of yours i beg your pardon it was the march girl your chum you're mistaken she gave me her word of honour hudson gave me his but that's not the point i acted badly i know it i've gotten you into a scrape and i want to get you out well after that bet story you told i don't see how you expect how about evangeline well i had to tell something so did i do you think it would help out if we announced our engagement we could make it just as temporary as you like of course i have no particular desire to marry just now so i would wish it to be a temporary thing but if it would help you out why of course i'm a little older than you are and no doubt you would not care to marry me but if having clearly understood the situation we entered into an agreement great scott i never heard such amiable condescension in all my life do you think i denounce my engagement temporary or otherwise to a man of your age why you're old enough to be my father besides i have no particular desire to marry just now 
and if i had well it wouldn't be to a man who hates poetry and novels and all the things i like and as for a man who has to trump a story about bets to excuse himself for wilfully kissing a girl on a moonlit night well i have my opinion of such a craven churl do you remember my ideal which you described so perfectly last night on the beach well it may interest you to know that he's a real man his name is bob crandall the famous yale centre and i've been engaged to him for a year i don't believe he'd care about any temporary engagements with old gentlemen well good night i hope you'll have better luck next time she strolls off laughing End of sketch 19Sketch 20 of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage Directions, read by Nemo. Mother, read by Emma Charlotte. Jimmy, read by Nemo. Molly, read by Eva Davis. Sketch 20 When Morning Breaks. Scene, Nursery, Morning. Discovered, Jimmy and Molly asleep. Enter Mother mother come chickens come it's time to get up breakfast in ten minutes let us see who can beat getting dressed this morning molly is it tomorrow yes dear now hurry exit mother jimmy jimmy get up it's tomorrow ah it is not you're always waking me up to say it's tomorrow when it ain't well it is cause mamma said so mamma yes when she came to say get up did mamma come in here why course i didn't hear her did she honest injun cross my heart and hope to die and we have to hurry up <laughs> it's cold first one that gets to the register can have it all to himself to get dressed on wild rush for the register i'm first you were not i had my foot on first and you shoved me ah get out i was on before you got started well i don't want any anyhow it ain't so very cold besides there ain't any heat coming up say mal hand me my clothes will you what'll you do if i will well i'll give you half the register all right now move over jimmy that ain't half bet i'll be getting on stockings bet you don't there ah you got it on hindsight of four that's the heel you big goose poor mary did i get your clothes on wrong what makes you call that foot mary uh, cause that's her name and the other one's name is john mine's names ain't Mine's name's is Maud S. in Heather Bloom. I bet mine can beat yours. Say, Ma, I'll beat you washin'. Well, you don't wash nice. Mama said so. You just wash a weenty bit in the middle, and I go all round. A neck, too. Sometimes. No use my washing my neck when well, Mama's always doing it. I know boys at school that don't never have necks done. Never not nice ones nice ones always has their necks did yesterday the teacher said solomon godowski when did you have your hands washed and he said last wednesday and she made him go right out and wash them i know a girl that never has her hair done not never if i had old long hair like yours i'd cut it off jimmy if i did cut it off would i be a boy then like you yep kind of would i be your brother then yep kind of and would you play with me tag and i spy and everything sometimes i would 
Or would I be in your gang? Yep. Kind of. Well, I will. Here are some scissors. Now you cut it off. Say, you'd better not. Mama'll be mad. No, I'm going to be a boy and go in your gang. You'll get a lickin' if you do. I don't care if I do, because I want to be a boy and play, and not have to practice, and not have to be a lady. James promptly begins to snip. Enter Mother. James Baker, what are you doing? He's cutting off my hair so I'll be a boy in his gang, and he'll play with me all the time and not tease me. James, I have the greatest notion on earth to give you a good whipping. Well, she made me. That's a nice thing for a great big boy to say about his little sister. She made me. Mother, can't I have my hair cut off and be a boy? My precious baby, that wouldn't make you a boy. And what would mother do without her girlie? I wouldn't have her change for all the boys in the universe. The girls have to be so nice and get hurted and teased, and boys don't. I want to be a boy, Mother. Mother gathers her into her arms. My blessed baby, you're learning the lesson of feminine limitations very young. Come, Jimmy, never mind the necktie until after breakfast. Come along, Ladybird. End of Sketch 20 Sketch 21 of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage directions read by Nima. Mother read by Emma Charlotte. Molly read by Eva Davis. Jimmy read by Nima. Sketch 21. Who's Afraid? It is bedtime for Molly and Jimmy Baker, and Mama is tucking them in to their two little beds. Mama. Now, lie still, Molly, dear, and don't kick the covers off. Molly. Mama, will you leave a little teeny weenty light burning tonight? Why, I expect so. Daddy and I will be just downstairs. If you are frightened, you can call. Jimmy. Ah, uh, she's the biggest fraidy cat. Now, James, none of that. I want no quarrelling nor talking. I want you to go straight to sleep. Mama turns the light low, kisses them, and goes out. I wish Susie Jones's mother was my mother. She leaves the light going full tilt. Every night. Susie told me so. Ah, uh, I bet she does not. Susie's the biggest storyteller in the world, next to you. Why, I'm not a storyteller, Jimmy Baker. You are, too, and you're a tattletale. I am not. I am not. Shh. Do you want Mama to come up here and whip you? Silence for a while. Jimmy? Will you tell me a story? No, I'm going to sleep. What do you give me if I do? I'll give you a... Uh... Will you give me your new jumping rope? Oh, Jimmy, not my new one. I'll give you my old one. It's most as good. It's better than my new one. No, I want the new one with the handles to make harness with. Oh, Jimmy... Well, now, you don't have to if you don't want to. Well, I will. But you won't tell one with bears in it, will you? Ah, oh, you big fraidy cat. Who's afraid? Jimmy gets up on his elbow and begins. Once it upon a time, there was a boy that lived in, now, Chicago. And one day, he was sassy to his father, and he up and runned away. His father did? No, of course not. The boy did. If you're going to interrupt, I ain't a going to tell it. He didn't like Chicago much anyway, because he had to go to school there. So he just up and walked off to, 
to New York. And when he got to New York, there was a pirate ship there at New York, and he got right on and went off to sea. All the pirates was black and big as, oh, they was awful big. How big? Big as Papa? Big as Papa? Why, they was giantses. And every pirate had a carving knife and a gun and a revolver. What for? Why, to kill people with you, silly. When they found the little boy was on the ship, they hauled him out and licked him with the end of a rope. Is that worse than the back of a brush? Ah, oh, lots worse. But, but, but the little boy didn't yell none. When they licked him, he didn't yell none. So they made him the captain of the ship, because he didn't yell none. And he said that they'd go to Kubi Libri and fight the Philippines, and they did. But while they was going there, a big shark. What's a shark? Don't you know what a shark is? Why, it's a big fish, as big as, as five elephants, with a mouth as big as this whole house, and teeth as long as from here to the corner, and if it wanted to, it could swallow all the houses in this block. Jimmy, can I get into your bed? Now, don't interlopt. When the shark saw the pirate ship, he has swummed right up and gobbled the ship down. And the little boy? And the little boy. But he didn't chew it none, because it was such a big mouthful. And, and when the boy got in the old shark's insides, he has tickled him on his insides, and the old shark coughed him up. Why, Jimmy Baker. Don't you believe that? That's in the Bible. And as soon as the boy got out, he began swimming and swimming and swimming oh he was this swimming for two months without nothing to eat oh he ate fishes and pretty soon when he was swimming along he came to a beautiful island and he went right up on it and there was a beautiful princess <sighs> what did she have on she had on a, a, a yellow curls and a crown and pink tights like the girl at the circus. When she saw the boy, she said that if he'd kill all the bears on the island, she'd marry him, and he'd be a king or something. So he said he would, and he waited till it was most dark, and then he built a fire. But where was the princess? She was in to supper, of course. He made a fire, and then pretty soon he saw great big shining eyes, and a great big mouth that went, Woo! Woo! Jimmy. Jimmy! What's that over in the corner? It's got fiery eyes. W where? I don't see anything. He takes a cautious peep. It's a moving. It's a coming after us. It's a bear. Mama! 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 End of section 21. Sketch 22 of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage directions and Mrs. Martin, read by Linda Olson Fytak. The Optimist. Scene, drawing room. Discovered, Mrs. Howard and a caller, Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Yes, it is nice weather today, but as I said to Mr. Martin this morning, we might as well make up our minds to a rainy month. March is the vilest month in this climate. I always dread it so. I just know I'll have a relapse and get the grip again. Oh, yes, I've been sick with it for weeks, and I'm just able to get out again. I always have things so much harder than anyone else. I haven't any strength or appetite, and I just know a rainy spell will set in and put me in bed again. No, I never do borrow trouble, but I think it's well to be prepared for anything. No, my dear, now don't think of making tea on my account. 
I couldn't swallow a drop. I don't eat a thing, not a thing. Your husband's been sick too, hasn't he? Threatened with pneumonia? Dear me, so many have died with it this winter, haven't they? I was threatened with it too, but I fought it off. I think there's so much in willpower, don't you? He's out again. Well, that must be a great relief to you. Yes, sugar and lemon in mine. Takes her tea. Have you seen Mrs. Matthews since she lost her husband? Well, from the way she takes on, you'd think he had been a saint. You know he was a perfect terror. We used to live next door to them, and I know. Why, he used to swear at her. But, dear me, she's forgotten all about it now. Some women are that way, you know. Just a little more, my dear. It's so nice. And one wafer takes more tea. Did you hear about that Sangster girl? Oh, didn't you? She eloped with a patent medicine man. Of course, I make it a point never to criticize anyone, but I always said that girl would come to some bad end. She was always laughing and carrying on. Never could take anything seriously. No, they say he's rich as Rockefeller, but then you never can tell. People do say such things. Just a little bit more, my dear, with sugar. Yes, I will have a wafer. They are so small. Takes more tea. I heard that Frank Staunton was going into business for himself. Of course, it's none of my business, but I should think he'd never dare to make any change with that flighty wife on his hands. Extravagant? Oh, why, I've seen her with three different hats on this spring. And flirtatious. You'd better keep your eye on her, my dear. I heard her say that she simply adored your husband. Goodness, I shouldn't think you'd ever have a moment's peace with such a handsome husband on your hands. We were talking about it the other day, and saying how strange it was that handsome men always marry plain women. Just one more cup. No. Yes, I will have another wafer. Takes more tea. Did you hear about the new baby at the Dixons? No, a girl. Yes, that's four. Of course, I don't want to say anything disagreeable, but I think the law ought to take children away from that sort of mother. Devoted mother? Mrs. Dixon? Why, my dear, she bathes a three-month's baby in almost cold water and lets it sleep on the porch in the winter time. And she puts it to bed at eight o'clock, just like a grown person, turns down the light and leaves it. Never rocks it, nor walks with it. Well, all I've got to say is, that was not called devoted when I was a young married woman. Well, just one drop more, and one wafer takes more tea. I must go. I want to be home when Mr. Martin comes. I feel sure that he is coming down with something dreadful. He looked so strange this morning. So many businessmen are dropping off these days. No, dear, no more. I'm sorry I couldn't do justice to your tea, but I can't touch a thing. Goodbye. Do come see me. I'll run in again and cheer you up. I hope your husband will come around all right. Adieu. Exit. End of Sketch 22 End of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook